I kept telling y'all it was coming. Finally, the first official episode of Ghost Speedways. And for the first one, as you can tell by the title, I'm going somewhere that, you know, is close to where I grew up. I mean, it is right down the road, Nazareth, Allentown. That whole area is just a quick, you know, shot down the turnpike for me. Did I ever get to go see a race there? No. But that's because we always went to, you know, both Pocono races in the infield there all weekend before everything happened in my life. So I never got to go, but I made sure I always watched the races and, you know, through all the history open for almost a hundred years through different owners, closures, surfaces, you know, upgrades until it was all done, you know, with the IndyCar, NASCAR and everyone else finally leaving Nazareth Speedway in the Lehigh Valley and, you know, so it was important for me that I was going to do this to go back home and go to that big track that, you know, was up there. And it meant a lot to that entire area. And you know, when I first, you know, heard it was, you know, going away, I almost like didn't believe it just because of all the work that, you know, they put into it, all the races that were there. And I mean, NASCAR, IndyCar, running stuff there with good crowds. You know, just like the last thing you expected to hear was that. And it was like a death in the family. It's like once they, you know, did the Pocono thing, they made it a doubleheader, and now there's, you know, only one race there. Like, I know what that does to an area, just cutting back one, let alone all of them. And again, I might have went straight, straight, you know, Pocono races right off the infield in the tunnel at a very young age, seeing all kinds of things that we all know we shouldn't be seeing. And I might have then also worked at Pocono after everything left, helping clean up the thing, made great money, by the way. So Ducky and Joe, I know you're, you know, thank you. Joe's not with us, but Ducky, I know you aren't listening to this, but if someone gets it to him, thank you, because that was amazing. Um, But I know what having, you know, two races did for the area around Pocono, especially how much they built it up around it to see it go down to one and just the business. And, that's just getting cut down to one. They still obviously do other things. IndyCar doesn't go back. So it's not a good thing. And I, you know, only imagine what the people around Nazareth, Allentown, that whole area, you know, went through. And a lot of people didn't even know it, you know, right now, because when it closed, don't even remember, don't have any recollection of it ever being there. It wasn't in their lifetime. So they honestly, you know, they have a valid reason to not understand that, you know, it was there because once they move on, you really don't hear about these things all that often, which is a damn shame. And hopefully that's the worst I get with my language, but it really is a damn shame that they don't get mentioned more. And this this is the way, you know, to give at least some of that, you know, history out there for the world so they can understand, you know, what the track was like, everything it went through, the owners, the adversity, you know, the winners, like there's so much that happens in all these, and they help build motorsports to what it was. So, first one we get into, said that as in, you know incorrectly as I could, will be Nazareth Speedway. Went through many names. Again, I only got to see it from you know the internet and all that. Again, went to races at Pocono that tapped us up, especially when they were like you know that close to each other months wise. So that tapped me out. Never got to go to the IndyCar races or anything at Nazareth. I'm granted Pocono's 15 minutes away, but the track had a very, very, you know, long history in its many different forms. Then again, people only, you know, some people only remember the big track there. No one really knows anything. You know, a lot of people, I should say, don't know a lot about it outside of that and fun fact it was started as just a half mile horse track in the 1850s you know the whole thing at the northampton county agricultural fairgrounds it was relocated after that it moved to its current spot where it sits now 1900 officially opened in 1910 and was known as nazareth fairgrounds track 
as the Nasser's Fairgrounds track. It was a half mile dirt track that was used primarily as a horse track, and it did host several, you know, car races through the years. Like if you look at many of the other you know, historical, like abandoned places, a lot of them, you know, they did a lot of horse racing and other things in them, and then it moved to you know late models and all that, and then it moved to stock cars, you know, and the progression, you know, went through all of that. You know, sprint cars, midget cars raced at a lot of these, you know, plays their open wheels and, you know, danger and all of that. And the racing was better between stock cars because they could beat and bang on each other and help phase it out. But a lot of them did start as horse tracks around, you know, the whole entire country. And I'm sure the whole entire world, because it just makes sense, you know, race the horses there and let cars come in every once in a while. And, you know, everything goes full circle with all of that. And in the 1920s, the track was expanded to a one-mile dirt track, and the focus was turned more towards motorsports again. The excitement, the crowds, the money, you know, just the action and all that helped bring it, you know, to something really cool. And this was, in, you know, a big growing part of it for the first major event was held in 1929. The Nazareth Speedway, which was a 100-mile championship car race, and was won by Lewis Meyer. Picture will be up when I share the links. When I do the substack, I'm going to have them all lined out for you so you can see all these people's faces and all of that and understand exactly you know what's going on so if you're listening to this and you can't see it find the socials because i'm gonna have pictures yeah more of them on facebook just because i don't have a limit like i do on twitter there's also instagram i'll have a lot of them there and i will write a sub stack to go with this and i'll have all the pictures even more and everything on there if you'd like to see what the man looked like. But he was the son of a racing family with his father and brother. His father was on you know, bicycle racing. And he began his racing career at the Legion Ascot Speedway in Los Angeles, California. He made his Indianapolis debut in 1927 in relief of Wilbur Shaw, where he drove 41 laps until relinquishing the ride back to Shaw in relief duty. He was the AAA national champion in 1928, 29, and 33. Three Indianapolis 500 victories, and he passed away in October of 1995 at the age of 91 after being inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame in 1993. I'm happy that he made it. You know, it wasn't you know, posthumously, you know, after he was gone. At least he got to be there and have that accolade. And again, there's a name you do not, you do not hear ever. And if you look through the records of a lot of these tracks, there's a lot of names that you don't know. And then there's a bunch that actually surprise you because you do realize their names from way back when. And that's very exciting to me. Uh, the one and one eighth mile D shaped semi banked oval opened in April, 1966 for dirt midget sprint and stock car racing and veteran Frankie Schneider won the first event. Fun fact about him. NASCAR convertible series career. He had nine races over a two year span with three top fives, five top tens. 9.9 average start and 10.2 average finish in the Cup Series. Seven years, 27 starts, one win, 11 top fives, 16 top tens, one pole, an average start of 8.3 and an average finish of 12.7. You can, that's, if you looked at how many broke down for some of those seasons, he was barely running any races, but to run only that many races in that amount of time and have an average start of 8.3 and average finish 12.7 with all that, that just shows, you know, sheer talent and all that. If you look at the starts per season, it was nowhere near, nowhere near full capacity. And that's really, really cool to see that. Then we move on to names that everyone, I mean, you better know. If you don't, something wrong if you don't know this guy's name. No offense, but you should know him. 1969, Mario Andretti won the USAC Nazareth 100 on the same day. The city celebrated his winning of the Indy 500. He's from that, you know, right there. So big thing to have him win the Indy 500 and then win the race on the same day. You know, and he means a lot. And a lot of people don't know that he's from right there. So big, big history for all of them out of that. And it would be the last championship race there before they went bankrupt and the racetrack closed for the first time in 1971. And sadly, this is where a lot of it started happening. You know, a lot of the bad stuff, the downscale, then the tick up, and then, you know, the ebb and flow of racing with a lot of these places, you know, where it's gone. Then it, it, it happens a lot, but it went through a few people after that. Originally acquired by Donald J. and Michael F. Ronka, 
for $225,000 in December 1973 at a sheriff's sale. With the goal of making an industrial park, it never came to fruition. It was then sold at a sheriff's auction again in 1979 for $205,000. And after being closed for a decade, it was reopened in 1981. After being purchased by Lindy Vicari, Michael Ronka, and Donald Westcott for $480,000. And the Nazareth National Speedway was back in you know action and operation and racing after a 10-year layoff because of, you know, I mean, six years trying to get an industrial park built and everything else. And that, you see a lot of them, like having stuff like that happen has killed so many racetracks. And, you know, you can go down to Texas World Speedway. They're trying to do something. And then they had all the damaged vehicles being stored there for, I believe, Hurricane Harvey. And that was it, just because they sat there for so long and everything just got so out of disrepair while it was covered in all these cars. They had nowhere else to put them. It went away. And... You know, same thing happened, but it just sat for forever, and I was very, you know, thankful to see it come back, you know, for any part of it did, again, because so many of them, they don't get the opportunity to, and, you know, breaks people's hearts when they see it. It sucked to see it go, even though I was never there, but at least it got to have a comeback after that. 10 year run of sitting dormant, but the track went to the one went from the one and one eighth mile to a one mile and finally held another event in 1982 with the running of the triple one hundreds from October 7th through the 10th. And even with the USAC championship dirt cars modified and the large crowds that they brought, which they did the facility went into bankruptcy again in 1985 and Carl Collins won the last race before that. It was a 40 lap modified stock car event on April 29th. 1984 then what you know i wasn't alive yet when this next thing happened but when i was growing up as a kid and i was seeing you know, what this person was doing racetrack was that's why i never expected to see what happened you know in such a short time he went from like all of that to just gone and it's really you know sad but if you look at it, in 1986 the racetrack was bought from the Bank of Pennsylvania by the captain himself, Roger Penske, owner of Penske Motorsports, Penske Race, whatever the hell you want to call the thing, the captain himself, years and years and years and years in motorsports. He's had many racetracks. I mean, what? He opened Fontana. I mean, he's done his name's on a lot. He now owns the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They put a lot of good work into upgrading some things there. So, Again, really freaked me out to see it go. But groundbreaking ceremonies for the new Pennsylvania International Raceway on October 16th. And when they did it, they paved the track on the old 1 1 8 mile D shaped track's footprint with the banking at 2.7 and 6 degrees in the corners and the first ever warm up lane to enter and exit pit lanes on an oval, which there's some history there because look, they all have them. I mean, most of them, you know, now have them to be able to do that. You know, safely and all that. So that's groundbreaking stuff there. And the inaugural race is won by Michael Andretti on September 20th, 1987. No surprise. A man can drive. His dad can drive. They can all drive. So that was really yeah, cool to see. 1988, the original track was sold. The circa 1900 track was sold, turned to a grocery store. And the NASCAR Bush Grand National Series at the time, there's one they... Like hearing Craftsman Truck Series come back. It'd be great to see you know, the Bush Series back. We'll never see it. But just because, that'd be really great. But they also started racing at Nazareth in 1988. The name was changed from the Pennsylvania International Raceway to Nazareth Speedway in 1993. And this is why I said, because I remember you know watching this stuff as a kid in those very little, you know, young years. And I was still going to the Pocono thing. So while I was watching this thing, like, if you go back to it, because by the time 97 rolled around, I was really old enough to understand, you know, everything that was going on in 1997. The bleachers were removed, the retaining wall in the front stretch was rebuilt, and the grandstands on the front stretch were replaced with high-rise grandstands, adding an additional 10,000 prime seats, which, you know, a lot of the races, they didn't have a problem filling. Now, you could see them when they were jammed with people. Um, and then in 1998, even more money was put in when the remaining wall in the back stretch was replaced, followed by the enlargement of both the media center 
and the infield care center in 1998 and 1999 and to replace those walls and the giant grandstands and to enlarge and, you know, do all of that money was going into it. They were doing, you know, fantastic with it. And, and that's, you know, 98, I turned 10, 99, I was 11. Like I was fully aware of everything that was going on there. And I was, you know, really excited. And in such a short amount of time, it had one of the grandest falls. Yeah, you know, I could remember and a lot of them, you could hear it. It still breaks my heart to see it gone. But, you know, start moving towards the rapid end of the racing action, the Nazareth Speedway. In May of 1999, the ISC, or the International Speedway Corporation, which is the parent company of NASCAR, acquired Penske Motorsports, and that started bringing the eventual end of racing at the facility because, you know, financial issues, poor attendance. It's just amazing that they were doing so good. They did all that, and then so fast. So fast to collapse. But the NASCAR Bush Grand National Series last race was held on May 15th through the 16th that weekend and was won by Martin Truex Jr. And the last IndyCar race was held on the weekend of August 27th through 29th of 04 and was won by Dan Weldon. And by May of 2007, after all the events were moved to other facilities that the International Speedway Corporation owned, the grandstands and the signage were removed from the racetrack. And I know people that lived in the area and they were, you know, broke their damn heart to see it happen. And I know people that went to those races all the time and it was, you know, like a death in the family. It was, you know, tragic to see it. It's sad to see, you know, what it's become now, but, you know, sadly this doesn't look like it's going to have a good ending because November of 2015, the facility was purchased by raceway properties, LLC, with the long-term goal of redeveloping the facility for warehouses and residencies and to build houses, which means it will be, it'll be gone forever. And then all the races that happened, you know, all the lives that were lost, which sadly a lot were back, you know, in those early years there, which got us the inner, you know, the innovation, you know, in safety and stuff to save lives. And, you know, whether it was the cars, drivers, tracks, like they all had fatalities and everyone, you know, that got us to where we were. And it, you know, we've seen racetracks end because, you know, fan fatality and boom, that was just it. You know, it, it happened all too much, but you know, to see the memory of all of that get wiped out for, you know, warehouses and all that is just, you know, it's just crazy. And just to think if it could have, you know, if they could have held on for just, you know, Roger or someone that cared, you know, could have held on for just a few more years. You know, what could have happened? What could have been with that amazing thing? And again, I can only imagine how everyone, the city of Nazareth and Allentown, the surrounding areas to include my hometown of Whitehaven and even Long Pond. You know, if there were Pocono is, you know, like just how much better that would make the whole area and all that, if it had stayed open, you know, kept all that coming in there and, you know, just the excitement and the action and giving people places to race and the money it brought into small local businesses and all that, like just to think, you know, the careers that could have been made if it got to stay open. But, you know, again, just because I used to work at Pocono, went to races there, I know what that brings into an area and excitement and, you know, the money, it just helps because there's so many small businesses, you know, in, especially in Pocono. I know you know, all of that little stuff and the money it packs in, you know, just to help the economy, especially with the way winters have been lately. You know, it's not like they've been the coldest or skiing, you know, resorts. They're still open, but the crowds aren't as big at the diner there. And, you know, I just know how weird it was when they took one race away from Pocono and, you know, how much that affected the air. I can't even imagine if Pocono was to go away. And that one actually, that one does sting because I know just how much people's years were made, at least their summers. You know, small town because they had the ski season, but then there's, you know, 
rafting and stuff, but it's not as big as people going to ski resorts and all that. So then the NASCAR crowd came in in June and then back in July and, you know, just helped the local economies and everything so much. And, you know, I know it's like to lose one. I strange feeling in my lifetime. I'm going to learn what it's like to have the same fate. I hope I don't, but only time will tell. And that's why it's so special to me though. Because I, I know what losing one race at Pocono did. I know the level of excitement that left the area and all that when Nazareth closed. Cause I don't think any of us really, you know, believed it just because of where it was and it was doing so well and expanding and improving and, you know, and, and here we are today and that absolutely sucks, but hopefully as our list, you know, of all these tracks keeps growing, we can save more of them like they did in North Wilkesboro. And I don't care what anyone says about the racing. It was a snooze fest. Kyle Larson made it look easy. That's what Kyle Larson does. He makes things look easy. Sorry. Uh, if you looked at the rest of the racing, that was actually really good. And, you know, don't, it's the garbage car. Car sucks on short tracks. It's plain and to the point. Straight and simple. It sucks. And as Junior said, because of the car and all that, how many years does North Wilkesboro have if they don't have, you know, a proper car to race there? You know, if the racing is going to be how it was. And that's a worry because they worked so hard to get it back. And again, the racing was terrible. We all know it. So it's not a track thing. That's car thing. And more of these places need to be saved. So hopefully we can. Hopefully that was just the first. But look at the Martinsville races. Short track back. It just isn't good on this car. But thank you again for, you know, finally checking out. Sorry, I've been making you wait for a couple weeks if you haven't been checking it out. But let me know what else you want to talk about. Let me know your thoughts on this one. You know, it was, you know, close to the heart. Don't know where we're going even next. I have a list. It just depends on, you know, where we go and how all the cards fall. But, you know, it was fun and there's so much more. So I'm going to keep putting out more stuff on the sub stack to keep that going. But find the show on your preferred platform. You know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Spotify for podcasters, Good Pods, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Audible, Overcast. We are also on YouTube Rumble, Cloud Hub and BitChute when they're not scheduled to go out at a certain time because you can't schedule them on there. Make sure you check out on all of them. Find the socials. They're all at Go Speedways, whether it is Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. Find the Substack. And share as much of it as you can for me to get as many eyes and ears as possible to get this thing off the ground. But I appreciate you all. I'll be back better and quicker than I was for this one. And I appreciate you all. Thanks for the time. Bye.